University of California, Irvine. It is my distinct privilege to be able to introduce Steve Whitaker today for uh, his winning the Lifetime Achievement Research Award. Lifetime Achievement Research Award. Fabulous. Half of the people in the room probably already know Steve. Um, those of you who don't should, if you just came in to say, well, this might be interesting. All right, let me tell you a little bit about Steve. All right, he is a professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, this, these are the criteria for getting the research award. Cumulative contributions to the field, development of new research directions, influence on the work of others, and active participation in the CHI community. So contribution to the field. He's done a lot of work about memory and how you can augment your memory to understand yourself better. So there's an application called ECHO which takes various snapshots of you various times of your life and then gets you to reflect on them, things a week ago, a month ago, et cetera. He'll probably, are you telling, talking yes, about Okay, sure. he'll tell you more about that. All right, he also does things about how file organization reveals personality. <gasps> Looking at my desktop, he can tell some things about me. Personal information management. He's gonna talk a little bit more about life logging, which is snaps of you throughout your life and how you understand, it's a little bit uh, in the same theme of ECHO applications. So these are just recent contributions to the field. Development of new research directions. That's a piece of his website on the right-hand side. It just keeps going. But again, the themes, and there are themes of research here about personal information management, long-distance communication, which is first when I first knew him. So it's technology and the social practices. Human memory and its augmentation for many purposes. And dot, dot, dot. It just keeps going. So influence on the work of others, 11,000 citations, that is a big number. I looked myself up and that's a big number. <laughs> All right, so he's co-authored with a number of really good people, Bonnie Nardi, who is also the night elf princess, Lauren Trevine, Alan Isaacs, Victoria Bellotti, Abby Sellen, John Tong, dot, 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 really amazing people. Where they're amazing, he's amazing, it's a great synergy. All right, so these are key people in the, in the field. Active participation in the CHI community. Well, he was the co-chair co of CSCW 2000 with Wendy Kellogg. These are some notable pictures. <laughs> it did go well. <laughs> uh, and it was interesting that at the CHI reception, Victoria Bellotti got up and sang jazz, and she was really good. And he got to stay in the presidential suite that George W. Bush was in when he was at the... Pre the I slept in the same bed as George W. Bush. That's, um, That's the quote. I can't say that. <laughs> All right. So another piece of his active participation is really stellar. He's the editor-in-chief of Human Computer Interaction, one of the top two journals in HCI. It was originally started by Tom Moran, who got his uh, induction into the Academy in 2000, 2001, I believe. Uh, and Lifetime in 2007. Now we have Steve Whitaker who got his induction to the Academy in 2008 and this year he's the uh, research, Lifetime Research Award winner. So Steve Whitaker, winner of the 2014 Lifetime Research Achievement Award. Please welcome him. Well, thank you very much. I think it's downhill from here on in. <laughs> Okay, get my glasses on. Uh, by the way, this was taken last week, not really, um, I guess, I think, to be honest, I think it was taken many years ago. Okay. But you haven't changed. I haven't changed a bit. So I should say, I, I, I've got an hour and 20 minutes of PowerPoint ever returns for us. Um, but I am very happy to take questions at any point in the talk. If you lot start talking more than me, I'm going to start talking myself again. But really, um, if there's any clarificatory questions, please fire away. Okay, so today I'm going to focus on email. Yes, I'm going to talk about, no I'm not. Um, I'm going to talk about technology and memory, and I'm going to talk about, um, so I guess, a journey that I've taken um, from first looking at this from a kind of life-logging perspective 
to the kind of work that we're doing at the moment, which is trying to look at uh, strategic reminiscence and basically how we can um, use uh, uh, tools that we devise to um, allow people to better reflect on their past and gain personal insight. So why should we be interested in memory? Abby's here, so she could answer that question. Um, memory is a fundamental human capability, which is intrinsic to many everyday tasks we do. There's some very interesting work by Conway, which suggests relationships between memory, in particular autobiographical memory, and one's sense of self. So Alzheimer's patients, for example, um, they do not have strong self-concepts, and they have low self-esteem as a result of that. And finally, this thing came up at the, uh, the plenary yesterday. There's a lot of interest in technology and memory in the context of offloading. So for example, popular scientific writers such as Carr say, whoa, it's a terrible thing. We're using cell phones to remember phone numbers, right? This is a dreadful thing. We're kind of undermining our memories in doing so. This is not a talk about offloading, but let me just tell you what cognition is involved in offloading. When you want to, and I'll, I'm saying this from my own research, not in this talk, but basically, if you want to offload, you have to metacognitively evaluate the state of your own memory and decide whether your unaided memory is good enough for the job. Then you have to, if you decide you're not going to use your unaided memory, you have to have knowledge about different external sources and make a decision about whether it's more efficient to consult an external source or to try and remember unaided. So to say that offloading does not require cognition is a rather simplistic perspective. OK, enough on car. So um, what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about three perspectives on memory. And the first perspective is uh, basically it's a technology-driven perspective, which basically says our own memories are deeply flawed. However, technology can come to our rescue. We've got great techniques now for logging generating rich logs of our everyday lives, why not use those to shore up our fallible uh, autobiographical memories? So I'm going to look at that uh, uh, approach quite critically. And the second uh, perspective I want to take, which is kind of a reaction to that, which is to look at situations in which we can see memory, uh, sorry, forgetting as being adaptive. So in contrast to this first perspective, which says it's a problem that we forget, there are strong perspectives within social science which argue that human memory and forgetting is a thing that we do that's adaptive, so we might use that as a different approach to design. And finally, I want to talk about this more recent work we've been doing, which is looking at tools that represent aspects of people's past to them, ask them to deeply reflect and reconstruct those, and we see good effects uh, changes in people's well-being as a result of doing that. So the perspective here is the notion that we can re reprocess our past to gain helpful personal insights. OK, so the kinds of outputs I want to talk about in the context of the talk are I will be evaluating various existing technologies as we kind of pass through. So I'm going to be talking about uh, life logging technologies such as SenseCam and Facebook, uh, a social, uh, social media system which you may have heard of. Um, I'll also talk about new design concepts that were generated in the context of this work. So I'll talk about um, technologies for impulse control and also, as I've said, technologies for mediated reflection. And in the context of this, I want uh, to use some of the empirical results uh, to start suggesting that we should maybe think both our concepts and the approach that we take to some of these technologies. Okay. Um, anybody, any questions about what I'm doing or who I am? No. Okay. Let's proceed. Okay. So um, life logging is a technology-driven vision which basically says human memory, very flawed, we forget stuff, let's fix it by using rich logs. So this is Gordon Bell and Jim Gemmell. What they basically say is, what if we could automatically save records of basically everything? Every bit of information we touch, every event we experience, and our reactions to those events. So you've seen papers at this conference. 
where people are trying to develop uh, technologies to uh, measure affective reactions. These technologies are not great at the moment, but those technologies will come. So we can fold those into the mix. So we're not only recording everything, we're recording our reactions to things. So one way of construing this is it's something like Facebook timeline, but to the max, uh, where it's basically every experience you have, we have data about. So this is what we want, a complete and accurate digital record. You're never going to miss a thing, and it's a way to fix fallible wetware. I photoshopped that. OK, <laughs> so here are the questions we ask. Does life logging improve memory? And if it does so, how does it help? So um, this is a, uh, a study uh, I did with various collaborators, at least two of whom I can see in the room. So um, we did an experiment using SenseCam, which is a sensor-driven camera, which an always-on camera, which takes photographs which are triggered by motion and light change. I guess also temperature change, but those are the main determinants. And in this study, we co-index that information to GPS, so we can not only say uh, what a picture was of, but also where it was taken. And uh, I guess many of you have seen life logging, but I just want to give you an impression of this. Just want you to watch it, those of you who haven't seen it before. But what you can do looking at this is you can just form uh, an impression or a view into somebody else's life. So as you can see, you can form, this is, I, I guess that evolved over, you know, maybe uh, a minute, but you can work out a lot of information about this person. Can anybody tell me something about this person? They ride a bike. They ride a bike, yeah. Was this in the US or Canada? No. No, but don't answer if you know, right? No. Uh, what gender is this person? Um, what are their interests, possibly? Shoes. Shoes and clothes. Okay, so, so as you see, this is not a huge amount of data, but there's a lot of personal information being provided here. So our question was, if you had access to this type of data, would this help you to remember autobiographical events? So quite a simple question. So we're asking, does life logging help memory? How, and if so, how does it help? So we can ask questions like, do people remember more events or more details about events? And then a very critical question about this type of technology is whether or not the types of memories uh, that are generated are reconstructive versus authentically, uh, they're mediated by authentic recall. What do I mean by this? We've all had the experience in looking at holiday snaps. Somebody shows us a holiday snap. We see ourselves in the picture. We have no recollection of being there at that time. But because we can see ourselves in the picture, we know we must have been there. So in that case, what you're doing from the evidence is inferring uh, a memory. It's not like you actually have, you see yourself there in your mind's eye. So what this type of application supports is it provides information cues from which we can form inferences. So one question in this study is the extent to which the memories that people generate here are these types of reconstructions versus uh, regeneration of the actual kind of mind's eye experience. There's also other research on uh, autobiographical memory, which, where it's argued that basically it's a set of pictures in the head, and the way that we remember things is just seeing ourselves in those situations. And we built four different types of retrieval interfaces for this technology, and one question we asked was, uh, what are the differences between retrieval in those four situations? And we also collected emotional data, which is to say people's affective reactions when they were recalling the events. OK, so we had 18 participants who wore SenseCam. 
Uh, this is co-indexed to GPS. They did it for two weeks, and then five weeks later, we tested them on their re recall of autobiographical events. So these are the four um, retrieval interfaces. This is the one that you just saw. This is the SNAPS interface. So this is a way to kind of fast forward, look at the images that represent your day. This is pure GPS. So this is just locational information, and that's stamped onto a map. And the different colors here represent the different days. So you can see where you went on different days of the week. Um, this is our control condition. This is trying to remember without any life logging aid. And the final condition is where we combine these two. So basically what you can say with this is, give me a picture of what I was doing at that location. Okay, so this is the user prompt, and this is a standard question that people ask in autobiographical memory research. So the prompt is, what did you do, where did you go, and who did you meet on whatever the day was? And then if people can generate uh, an event response to that, we ask them a bunch of questions. And we're trying to get at whether or not this is reconstructive versus, um, if you like, seeing it in your mind's eye. So we ask them uh, the extent to which they know this versus remember it. And then we ask their affective reaction um, to the recall of that event. So one question we ask is, how many events do people remember? So these are instances of the type of events that people remember. They talk about driving kids to school, going out to lunch, and so on. It's just think kind of uh, calendar type events. And then when they've retrieved an event, we get them to talk about details of it, which might be people, places, and topics. So had lunch with Jack and Jill. And in this situation, they get as long as they like to look at their life log with the particular interface that they're given. So now here's a, an exercise for the uh, audience. How many additional events do you think you would be able to recall using that technology over and above what you think you'd be able to remember just unaided? How many people think more than five? Okay, how many people think more than 10? Okay, any advance on 15? How many people think 15? Okay, so we're doing well. How many people think fewer than five? Okay, okay. So I guess the mean's about 12. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I'm really good at this kind of crowdsourcing stuff. Okay, so here are the results. So this is organic memory. So this means how much you remember without any technology. So what this means is the average is uh, 0.5 events. What this means is that if we ask you about two days, you remember one event. So that's... Uh, quite striking. Um, so this will be the equivalent of me asking you what you were doing on March the 29th, right? And unless it's your birthday or it's your kid's birthday or something, you're going to have no idea, basically. Okay. What was really interesting to us is if we compared this with the interface that you just saw, people didn't do significantly better, right? And they didn't do 15 events better or 12 events better, which is what you guys were predicting. They got about three more using the best version of the technology, which is where you get the GPS information and the images. So this is somewhat surprising. So the next question we asked was, well, why do people not do too well in that situation? And people told us two things. One immediate comment is, there are too many images. And then the second thing, which was more interesting and profound, was they talked about the confusability of images. So people basically said, those are kind of familiar images, but I cannot see which of many habitual events that I experienced they refer to. So this is quite dispiriting as a technology. If I wear it, what I get is a lot of pictures of me in front of a computer screen or in meetings with the same set of people, right? I don't know which day uh, that image in front of the screen refers to, nor do I know which of those meetings uh, I can identify. So you can't use the technology to identify specific events. So the next question we had was, what are the kind of underlying processes here? And we can see that, as we expected, about half the time when people are using the technology, it's not like it, uh, it, it regenerates 
the, an image in their mind's eye. They look at it as data and they kind of work out what it was that they were doing. So this person says, snaps usually made me remember. Snap tracks and tracks made me figure out something must have happened. And this was kind of interesting. What this person, this person usually walked around town and when they saw that their GPS trail uh, was moving faster, they worked out that they had to be using some kind of locomotion like a taxi or public transport. So they worked out it was a taxi day, and then they worked out which particular day that referred to. So this is inference. It's not seeing it in your mind's eye. And then the final thing is that pictures, and this is maybe consistent with some of the literature on autobiographical memory, pictures, the two cases where we had pictures, those were more evocative. OK, so what we concluded from this was that somewhat counterintuitively, certainly as far as Bell and Gemmell are concerned, a rich record doesn't guarantee total recall. And what we're seeing as well here is that when people are using these types of technologies, it's not like what happens is that memories are captured by the technology. What you're generating is a bunch of cues from which people make uh, often uh, different types of inferences about what they're seeing in those cues. Pictures are evocative, and we've also seen that too many images can be confusable. So now I want to quickly have a diversion where I, t I talk about a couple of systems that we built which actually attempt to address this confusability problem or the problem that we're kind of overgenerating too many images. So the image overgeneration problem. So we need to have some kind of mechanism to select important images. So one way that we can get a handle on this is to look at user actions. So we use two cues to try and decide between all these images. One cue is basically saying that events that you repeatedly access, we're going to infer are important. Right? So if somebody repeatedly pulls up a particular image and looks at it, we're going to promote that image. Secondly, in social settings such as this, if you're all wearing sense cams, we could vote up different images. So if you like watching uh, the sense cam video unfold, you could vote that image up. Okay, so these are examples of the uh, types of interfaces we built to this. This is in the context of a teaching application, an educational application. And what you can see is that what we've done here is images that are frequently accessed for a particular user get bigger in kind of manga style, comic style. So basically, if you want a summary of kind of what's more important, you can look at the larger images. So this image down here is the one that's most frequently accessed. And obviously, you can use the same kind of mechanisms with social data. So you can use popularity to kind of promote different image types. And I'm not going to go into uh, our evaluations of this technology. But basically, if you provide these types of uh, access to these types of images for students, um, their ability to remember stuff from classes improves, and they get slightly better grades. Okay. So that was uh, uh, an excursion into life logging. We drew a number of conclusions about that, which is that it doesn't quite live up to its promise. And maybe the processes are rather different um, from those that are sketched out by that vision. So I now want to uh, talk about a, a, a kind of diametrically uh, opposed approach to the problem, which is instead of saying that forgetting's a, a, a problem, what we do is we try and orga uh, emulate what our organic memory processes are like. So instead of trying to fix organic memory by recording everything, what if we try to use adaptive forgetting as a way to kind of motivate designs? So I just want to talk about a little bit of psychology here uh, in relation to adaptive memory. And the main thing I want to talk about here is people's positivity biases. Um, and there are a number of demonstra repeated demonstrations which show that people remember, generally remember more positive events in their lives, and they also edit out uh, negative or upsetting events. So um, very quick run through. Um, you can ask people to remember stuff about their past in various ways. It kind of doesn't matter what you do. You can say to them, keep a diary. You can say to them, uh, tell me about your life. You can say to them, um, you know, uh, keep logs. Whatever you do, in general, they remember about twice as many positive compared with negative events. A second interesting phenomenon it concerns 
people's affective rela uh, reactions to events over time. So what this graph shows you is that when we re-remember an event, we re the affect is less strong. So if it's a positive event, highly positive event, um, you know, you might just have won yet another Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> You're up about that, but yes, you know, a week later, you know, the, that moment is gone. So even with very positive uh, experiences, affect drops when you re-remember them. But notice here, uh, the depiction here is of very negative events. And the thing to notice is that negative events improve. That's to say you get less negative about them faster than positive events degrade. So the net gain is we're getting more positive over time. This is called the fading affect bias. The final thing which is kind of interesting is that we edit out a negative aspect of events. Um, so there's some really interesting research which uh, has people remember generally quite, um, it, it, it records people's experiences in real time of different types of events and then ask them about those events subsequently. So uh, let's say uh, you were gonna go to Disney World with the kids. Um, we have you logging your experiences and your reactions in real time. What people say is they get to the airport, terrible cues, right? They're pretty, they feel pretty negative about that. Get on the plane, there's somebody sticking their elbows right in them. Feel terrible about that. When you ask them about that holiday, three or four months later, all that's gone, right? So in the moment, we see the negative events. In our recall, things get kind of positive up, right? So these are three mechanisms by which organic memory is making us kind of feel more positive about our lives. Okay, so now we can reframe these types of questions we're asking earlier in the context of situations where maybe we don't want a complete and accurate record. So we've done so, I've done some research with Corinna Sass where we looked at um, social media and personal digital possessions in the context of a breakup. And this might be a situation where we don't want perfect recall because this is an upsetting or depressing situation, you may not want to be constantly reminded about the exact details of this situation. So what we did was we did an interview study with 24 participants who are in their 20s. Key thing here is that they were kind of spending a lot of time online, living their lives online. They'd all recently experienced a breakup following a long-term relationship, and we're basically asking the extent to which technology presented them with problems in this situation. So, what we saw partly arose from the fact that they had all this digital stuff. And I see William Odom in the audience, he will resonate with this. It's, there's a lot of this stuff that all of us now have. One of the problems is it's not really that well organized. So in this type of context, what a, a problem for uh, participants was that they would constantly accidentally encounter some evocative or upsetting digital possession. So music, photos, and social networking information is highly evocative. You know, um, plus, a lot of it is very, very available. So it's quite easy in this situation. You're one click away from being able to check your ex's Facebook status. And I can just brief sidebar, even people who unfriended their ex I had instances of people going around to a friend's house who they knew were still friends with that person so that they could do this, right? And I'll talk a little bit more about impulse control in this situation. Okay, so one of the problems for people was life's kind of online, so you're kind of one click away from highly upsetting information. So this person says, his uploads on Facebook make me feel hurt. What hurts are pictures with his new friends and new experiences because I can see him but cannot talk to him. And it's well documented that Facebook is kind of hard to interpret in emotional situations because it doesn't provide you with a, a lot of context. But here is somebody with a lot of motivation to misinterpret. And part of the problem is people's stuff is all over the different devices they're using, and this ubiquity means that you kind of accidentally fall over this type of information all the time. So there are some songs that recall feelings from that period. I listen to them, and this hinders moving on. Pictures always make me remember a good memory, so I try not to look at them because good memories also link to bad memories. So 
The other thing that we did was we looked at how people dealt with this information. And I want to talk about three basic strategies that people had. Some people trashed everything, other people kept everything, and then I want to talk about a more interesting, uh, to me, that's a judgment, but a final set of, uh, of users who engaged in what we called uh, selective disposal. So some people, you know, and uh, you know, maybe you can see this in offline relationships too, some people, they just want to immediately get out of that situation and move on. Having photos on my phone and computer did cause me to feel sad, but I immediately removed them after the breakup in order to move on. So that's one approach. Now one problem with this approach is that, you know, after some time has passed, if you don't want to kind of have a negative view about that period of your life, you want to kind of salvage something from it. So this is what these sorts of people said later. Some books and music would continue to remind me of him. I didn't keep those because I felt it would not be productive for my attempts to move on. Now I wish I kept them because they form an important part of my life. Okay, so this is the downside of trashing everything immediately. Okay, so then there were opposite people who just kind of kept everything, right? And these kind of relate somewhat, these distinctions relate to whether or not you're the dumped or the dumpy. So this person says, I kept everything, pictures, videos, and messages about her. And what they say is that this is quite disruptive. Pictures hindered my moving on. When I looked at them, they would make me remember him. I just try not to look at them now, but at the very beginning of the breakup, I looked at them frequently. These possessions don't help me. Okay, so then we got to some kind of more, well, I thought some very revealing strategies. So some people tried to stop themselves reprocessing this stuff by kind of making it harder to obey their impulses to look at it. So people would do things like try and collate all this information and put it in a place where they still had it, but it was less accessible. So this person, one person put stuff on a hidden folder, another person put it on a USB stick and removed that USB stick from their kind of local environment. This person says, I deleted all the message, though I backed them up. I put all the digital material into a file and set as hidden, right? Other people put stuff on an old phone and give it to somebody else, right? So they're treating um, people uh, in their social circle as kind of gatekeepers. That's quite a responsibility for some people, but they, the incentive here is they want to use that person to stop you just immediately looking back and reconsuming that information. Some people would actually drop this information off with family, you know, who live kind of many miles away. Okay. And the, uh, the other thing that people, the final strategy that we talked about is um, that some people selectively dispose. So what they tried to do was process, and this was often, you know, several months after the breakup when they had some perspective, they would selectively dispose around a few valued possessions. And this, although we weren't evaluating this, this seemed to be the most uh, adaptive of the strategies. I actually had a little cleanup there. I deleted a bunch of emails I had from her, cleared all her stuff off my computer, deleted my, her number from my phone. But I kept her photos. Someday I want to, may want to revisit some of the times we share, just not right now. Okay, so you're trying to find a subset um, because there's something you still want to retain some value to that relationship because you don't want to kind of write off that entire phase of your life. So, just to summarize, we're talking here about the value of adaptive forgetting. So having these very rich records presented problems to people. We found these different strategies for disposing of digital possessions. And I want to talk a little bit about some design implications of, of doing this type of digital disposal, in particular of these, uh, trying to build on some of these um, uh, adaptive processes uh, that people are engaged in. So one thing that people were very interested in, in this case, was some notion of kind of automatic harvesting. So because stuff is kind of spread all over the place, then what you want is some kind of magic system that will uh, collate all this stuff so that you can I, I kind of actively manage it and ring fence it. So we call this a Pandora's box, and I now see that there's a startup called Kill Switch which offers to do exactly this for you. Right? So basically, gather together all the data about the X and trash it for you. Now, I would argue that that's not necessarily maximally adaptive. 
but it's out there. Uh, that's, as I say, that's, that's a, a, a company that's developed that idea. I guess we're very interested in um, these uh, techniques or strategies that uh, we saw users uh, developing for what we called impulse control. So the, the problem, if you remember for people, is that if they're not careful, they engage easily in uh, upsetting behaviors by straightforwardly reaccessing upsetting materials. So what they did was all these kind of clever strategies which allowed them to kind of put distance between them and that data. So what if we could kind of create applications that, where you could kind of profile yourself and say something like, I know where all that data is, I want to access it now, but I'm gonna put a setting on there which will allow me kind of like a timeout period before I actually follow through on that. So I could set a 24 hour interval, you know, so I'm drunk, you know, I come back one night, you know, I miss this other person, right? I feel a distinct urge, this is true, we had people saying things like this, I feel the distinct urge to look at their stuff but I've set a, a default on my system which allows, I can't access that data for 24 hours, maybe and, and then I've sobered up. And you can imagine that you could do the same thing uh, with social data, you could actually appoint a gatekeeper, you know, so in order to look at that data, you would actually have to talk with this friend, trusted friend, so you'd actually have to negotiate your reason for wanting to see this data. But what these are all about is stopping people from engaging in these, um, uh, what seem to be uh, destructive impulses. And then the final thing that we saw was we want to kind of develop new methods which will allow people to kind of actively reappraise their past, like the selective disposers. So these people, if you recall, what they're trying to do is to kind of systematically process important parts of their past, if, if you like, to kind of uh, craft what they can salvage uh, that's positive from the relationship. Okay, so this is what we've done so far. We've talked about the life logging approach, which is the uh, record everything approach. I've now talked about the diametrically opposite approach, which is adaptive forgetting, which is the notion um, that we maybe don't want to remember everything, and we could build systems which are based around uh, positivity and editing out negative events. Last part of the talk, I want to talk about technology-mediated reflection which is a bunch of tools that we've developed which allow people to actively reprocess their pasts. So um, this is an example on the right-hand side. You can see the Echo application, which allows you to straightforwardly log daily events. So it's like tweeting to yourself. Uh, you write a short description, journal-type description of something that happened in your day. You take an image, and then the system presents that uh, image and your account back to you. Oh, you also do an affective reaction to that. Um, the system presents that uh, information back to you subsequently and asks you to reappraise it. So the idea is that what we're trying to encourage people to do is to reconstrue or uh, revisit, actively revisit aspects of their past. And the idea is here that we can use these types of rich personal records that the technology affords um, to allow us to kind of better understand ourselves and improve emotional well-being. And I'll talk about how we uh, measured that. Okay, so what's the problem here? So one of the problems for people is um, it's often complicated to detect relationships between uh, what we do and how we feel. So one way of construing this is there's kind of a problem in doing emotional pattern detection. So what are the connections? How do we infer connections between events and the emotional uh, reactions that uh, they engender? So one of the things that technology can allow us to do is to record and externalize those connections. So we might be able to look at situations uh, that we want to seek out because we have positive reactions to those or situations that we want to avoid because we have negative reactions to them. And also what the technology might do is give us insight into successful or unsuccessful strategies for dealing with situations. So here's some data from long-term usage of our system. It's a very simple example, but what you can see from this is how this person's emotions change different days of the week, right? So uh, this is quite a common pattern. Start off the week well, uh, plunged into despair, and improve as the weekend approaches, right? Um, that's a standard pattern. 
Now let's talk about, you know, it's a lot of data here for a particular user. This is time of day effect. So don't, you know, again, fairly obvious, don't make life decisions at uh, 3.45 in the morning, <laughs> right? Because your emotions are extremely negative, right? What you can see is this person had um, an unusual emotional pattern because what we saw for, for most of the rest of the users is people generally uh, start off days well, and then uh, as they get into work, their mood gets depressed, and then they get a pickup towards evening, okay? But what you can see here is if you have this type of data, then people can form inferences and, and they can uh, judge patterns about their everyday emotions. Okay, so what we're interested in here is not just remembering, but we're interested in reconstruing. And um, it, I've been really, really struck by Penny Baker's work here on emotional writing and the emotional writing paradigm. And what he's shown across a bunch of studies is very, very striking about the astonishing effects of cognitive reconstruct. So, you know, just very quickly, what you do in emotional writing is you take a negative experience, a traumatic event, and you write about it repeatedly, right? And the events, the, uh, uh, the effects are astonishing because you can do this, uh, you can get some of these effects with, you know, minutes of emotional writing. The more times you do it, uh, the stronger the effects you get. But basically, if you write about things that are troubling or problematic to you, you have reduced medical visits, um, improved immune responses. Uh, in the workplace, you get better grades, you're more likely to uh, get re-engaged in the workforce, um, uh, less likely to be uh, an absentee at work. Increased subjective well-being and even kind of basic cognitive functioning seems to improve. So one ex the actual explanation of this is not entirely clear, but one explanation of this is it's kind of like a classic Hollywood redemption narrative, right? So remember what I said about negative events getting better the more times you thought about them. That's a fundamental aspect of human memory. But what people do in this situation is if they're repeatedly writing about a negative event, they get more positive about it. And one inference you can draw about yourself there is that you're a resilient person, right? So I feel more positive about this thing, which I felt negative about in the past. Ergo, I've got very good uh, strategies for dealing with the negative. That's, that's one explanation of these effects. And you can also get uh, effects for reflecting on the positive past. So more enjoyment of life, increased subjective happiness. Um, uh, people also have more uh, positive affects. And this can be used strategically. So one analysis of nostalgia is, quotes, it's a vacation from the present. So feeling depressed, think about positive achievements that you've engaged in in the past. And finally, there are benefits as well um, from various studies about simply recording and registering emotions um, in real time. And there are two mechanisms suggested here. One is that you can savor the positive, so you have enhanced awareness and emotional intensity about positive aspects of your life. And also, if you can label something as being negative, it allows you to disclose that negative emotion. So it imposes organization on that negative experience and increases your understanding of the negative. Okay, so we want to explore these ideas with the ECHO system, um, which we, we, we're calling technology media to reflection. And the key thing about this technology is it's kind of different from human memory because we can actually use the technology to control when people reflect, right? So one of the problems with organic memory is, in particular for uh, people who are said to be ruminators, is that they just remember negative thoughts. You know, they have no control over that. What we can do with the system is, according to our algorithm, we can represent information about people's pasts uh, according to our own schedule. Plus, you can easily, it's a mobile app, and it's downloadable. I'll give you the, you know, all the addresses at the end. So you can easily log and easily remind people in order to do this uh, reconstruct process. So it's a very simple idea. You journal daily events and emotionally rate them. The system sends them back to you and asks you to reflect on them. And this is similar to uh, Dan Cosley's pensive system. Okay. 
So, you know, here's a post, an echo, right? We're just learning how to grow vegetables. The picture's down there of the, of the vegetable box. So I'm hoping these turn out well, dig a hole, put in plants, water. How hard could it be? And this person's pretty positive about that. Okay, so then you have your original entry, and then, you know, a year later, you get that back, and the system says, um, look at this event again. Uh, now I want you to uh, reevaluate or reconstruct that event. Okay, so our research questions here are, does this type of approach, technology-mediated reflection, improve emotional well-being? If so, how? Right? And it's not necessarily the case that this has to work, because remember from the last uh, study that I talked about, if we're constantly bombarding people with highly negative information about their past, this could potentially undermine uh, their well-being. So this is the study. Um, so we have uh, a pretest where we give people a battery of well-being scales. Uh, these are standard scales. If you're interested, I can tell you about them afterwards. Then we have three conditions. You can either just record experiences. So basically, you register a particular experience. You never see it again. Plus your emotional reaction, never see it again. Um, the second condition, you do that recording, but then you get the event presented back to you, so you're intended to reconstruct it. And then we have a bunch of controls where we have people use the system um, to record neutral or very boring events, right? And that was a, an extremely difficult thing to get people to do. Um, and then we do a post-test on the same set of uh, well-being scales. We analyze, we collect logs from people. Uh, so it's up to people whether or not if, the, if they want to share that data, they can do so. They can also delete particular records be before they share with us. So I should say all this is the information sits on the phone. We don't see any of it unless the users choose to share it with us, right? And I, I guess the majority of them kind of clean up uh, their records and, and share them with us. But I have seen some extreme stuff, really. I mean, it's, it's very interesting what people will share. And then we do an exit interview with them uh, so they can tell us about their experiences. OK, so this is the design. We have a bunch of people who are doing recording. So they record a subject, their affective reaction. And then they say something about it and take a picture. And they might do that for multiple different types of events and react differently to them. Uh, we have a bunch of people who are doing reflection. They do the same kind of thing as the recorders, except that a little while later, we represent those events to them, and we ask them to reevaluate them. And we're looking at the effects of those on emotional well-being. So what we expected was increased well-being for both record and reflect compared with our controls, but we also expected greater benefits for reflecting over recording because of the, the, this additional reconstruct process. Okay, so this is what we found, uh, and I'm not showing the controls because there were no effects with the controls, but basically across each of those scales, with the exception of mindfulness, we, f we find that using this technology uh, promotes well-being. However, we don't get the effect that we expected, the difference between reflecting and recording. So let me just talk about how we think those processes are working. OK, so how do these benefits arise? And I should say, this is quite a striking result because we've deployed this technology in the wild. We have no control. We've told people what they're expected to do with it. Um, you know, we're relying on them uh, making recordings each day. Um, but you know, it's quite striking compared with a lot of ways of conducting studies. Um, this sort of felt like we did not have a great deal of control over what people were doing. So um, I, I personally am, um, you know, delighted that, you know, the study seemed to work in the way that it did. Okay, so how do the benefits arise? So uh, what we did was we used the Loop program, which is a word analytic program, and we looked at people's posts, and we looked at the relationship between the information in their posts, these are all their logs, and changes in emotional well-being, right? And what we wanted to see was, were the particular things that people, were topics that people are talking about, which seem to promote emotional well-being. And what we found was very different patterns in the recorders. These are the people who just registered the information, their emotional reaction, from the reflectors. So the recorders, basically, they spend most of their time talking about other people, sex, and relationships. The reflectors um, 
much more kind of action dominated. So they talk about a lot of things they're doing. And then we see words which are, we see a lot of verbs, we see verbs which are associated with the present and the future. So their logs seem to be much more kind of plan oriented. Okay, so recorders analyze their life, especially their relationships, drawing lessons in the moment. Reflectors report on their activity, often quite briefly initial posts, but then later drew lessons when they had perspective. And they did this about both positive and negative events. So let me provide you with some examples there. Okay, so this is a recorder, and she's talking about her relationships. And this is an instance, you know, so people are taking this application seriously because they're discussing real problems that they're having with the application. I'll show you more examples of that later. I don't understand men. I don't know what they want. If I'm being honest, then I hurt their feelings. If I'm being nice, they take me for granted. If I try and be adaptive, they think I'm flaky. Maybe I'm just hard to get along with, whatever. There's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> okay. So, so now let's look at uh, typical uh, uh, posts from uh, reflectors. So this is another person. My boyfriend's not texting me often enough, frowny. I really wish he would text me more often. Okay, so this is just a day later. I guess I'm not that angry. I'm sure I can at times be that crazy girlfriend who texts too much and is overbearing. I'm sure he can get annoyed too, right? So just a day later, got some perspective on uh, what she now thinks is maybe not very appropriate behavior. Okay, and reflectors can also learn lessons from apparently positive experiences, right? So here's somebody, Starbucks for the third time today, they're pretty happy about that, right? Okay, yuck, this is 10 days later, I should not be drinking any more of that fatty sugary food. So the system's reminded them of this, they have a weight loss goal, and this is now a problem they can see in their behavior. So one of the things that we found very interesting, particularly about the people who are using the reflection version of this, this system, was they were using it, using it for personal change goals because it allowed them to see over time what progress they were, making, uh, they were making in trying to meet those goals. Okay. So now what we've seen is this kind of TMR approach improves well-being. And what's interesting is we still get benefits even when people see their unedited past. So this is an important distinction between this and organic memory, because if you remember, your organic memory automatically edits up the past to make it feel more positive. We're showing people their past, warts and all, unedited, and we still get these benefits, right? So what people are doing with the technology is they're dispassionately looking at things and making decisions about um, how they feel differently about things, even though they're saying exactly how they actually felt about that thing at the time. Okay, so this is one of the comments at the exit interviews. So this person says, I think it improved my well-being because it sort of forced me to think of these negative things as problems to be solved, right? Revisit them and think of them as a continuing process rather than some isolated negative event. It was sort of empowering, right? So as I say, there's a lot of use uh, of this application for kind of handling what people saw as being kind of repeated problems in their lives. Okay, so I just want to finish by talking about some very long-term data. So we have a bunch of people who've now been using the system for about eight months altogether. So these people are very committed to the system and clearly they believe that it's doing something for them. And what we're now exploring is maybe longer-term visualizations. So what we did with this uh, procedure is we analyzed their data, we generated a bunch of visualizations, and we asked people whether those visualizations were useful and what sort of inferences and utility they could draw from them. So this you've already seen, which is somebody's uh, daily, uh, weekly, uh, day of the week emotion ratings. This is another example. Um, this is time of day effect. But here's another one, which is a not very good visualization. But what it shows you is the redemption narrative. So what you have here is um, negative events. And what a positive, so this is the first instance of a particular event, which was registered as a four, which is slightly negative. It goes to being a six when it's reflected upon. So positive slope here means redemption. People are feeling more positive about past negative events, right? That's to say, 
there's a positive slope. So what you can see from this graph is there's only one instance here of something that became more negative. So what the inference that this person can draw is that in general, they feel better about negative stuff. Okay, so here are some things that people said uh, about the, uh, the insights they drew. And I should say two of these people have actually gone out and sought professional help through therapy. And I have to say, you know, as somebody who's worked with technology most of my life, most of the stuff we build, people couldn't care less about, right? And in this context, to actually have people uh, say these kind of things about the technology is very striking to me. So this person says, it gives, me, it gives a window onto what you're feeling. It gives insight in order to change. People talk about positive experiences. If something makes me happy, I'll do it again. Obvious point, right? Negative, right? So this is one of the pe people who end up seeking out professional help. Echo gave me a snapshot of meltdown moments. I could look at those, and I could see that those things weren't normal. It forced me to confront my reactions and myself. I learned from it. When I saw one of those memories, I saw that I needed therapy. Recording it, putting it down, thinking this is not the way I want to be. So it's kind of a mirror to how you are emotionally. And this person saw that, and she took action based on it. OK, more from her. Provides a mirror to the moment that you can't forget. You can't delete it, all right? You see the rating and the title. You can't run away from it. I saw something that said I started that argument. So she had repeated problems that she and her boyfriend used to get into these absolutely awful arguments, and they couldn't, they couldn't break out of that, and they couldn't, both of them thought the other person was completely responsible for that situation. I have never been in that situation myself. <laughs> and then she, she says, finally, you know, I, I really am a jerk, and this isn't his fault. Right? Because now she's got some record that she can look at. And then she says, now I don't have emotional overreactions, and it doesn't end up the same way. Before I went into meltdown, now we have a difference of opinion. Okay? And so this is a different person. I think it improved my well-being because it sort of forced me to think of those negative things as problems to be solved, revisit them, and think of this as a continuing process rather than some isolated negative event. It was sort of empowering. Okay. So let me sum up, right? So I've talked about three different approaches to memory. The first one, the life logging one, which kind of says, our memories are lame. We ought to fix them with technology. And it turns out, in practice, the technology doesn't seem to work that way. The second approach is to say, well, actually, there's good adaptive reasons why human memory works the way it does. And we can imagine designs which are based around trying to forget. And then the final approach is to use technology to have people actively reconstruct aspects of their past, which I believe I've shown can mediate and help with their well-being. So what the last thing does is it helps people generate insights from rich personal data. OK, so what are we doing next? Um, I'm very interested in trying to take some of these long-term visualizations and patterns and trying to put them back in the application. Right? Because it seemed like these long-term users were able to learn from those things. So very interesting. If you show them like time plots over the months they've been using the system, they're really interested in maxima and minima. So when did I feel my worst? And why did I feel my worst? When did I feel my best? And why did I feel my best? So they'd be looking up echo events from off those peaks and troughs. Um, I'm, uh, what we're also working on, we have some very promising data which suggests if you have people do more structured reappraisal, which is like you have people log things and then, um, so this is like uh, in the context of people who are having uh, sleep problems. If you have them analyze a situation where they had difficulty with sleep and try and generate a plan which can address that problem, we can show that this helps certain people improve their sleep patterns. And the last thing is, currently what we're trying to do is tease apart. In our current procedure, we don't legislate what kind of events you register. We've just run some studies which are having people uh, just log positive events and just log negative events. Um, so that's it. That's stuff in, in process. Uh, questions, please. And they, if, you, if you're interested in the apps, there's an iPhone version, there's an Android version, which are free downloadable. Let me just interject here. Normally, this is Q&A. 
I want it to be C Q and A. So you're allowed to get up and give a comment or some of your own related work, as well as questions that he can answer. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. Am I being? <laughs> thank you for the invitation to make a comment. Um, <laughs> right I, I think this is a great example when I think of the original Total Recall book of the difference between the technologist perspective and an HCI perspective. And I, I, I want to congratulate you on that. But I, I wondered if uh, some of the results around thinking of our lives as a project, mm -hmm. is that cultural? Uh, I think mean, that way, but I always think that's like a American thing. <laughs> I, think, I think that could be true. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, I, I don't know how, precisely how we would tell that, but certainly maybe airport bookshops would provide a window into that. So certainly it's, it's a concern of Americans, and I guess um, since one of the founders was very concerned with that, uh, what Franklin was very concerned with um, uh, self-development. Uh, I think that's an interesting question. We've only done this research in the U.S., but I think that's, that's, I that's a, a strong yeah, thank possibility. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for the interesting talk. Um, the companies to which we outsource our memories in a way, they have a business imperative. So I can see how uh, in the same way that marketing companies now do product placements in movies and the things that we experience, wouldn't they be able to um, do an experience placement where you put into the photographs, highlight certain things in the photograph that point to their products. So I know that in some products they're looking into adding, uh, you know, when you do a run in the Fitbit, uh, if you're using Nike shoes, they make sure to tell you so. Uh, if you're here having a good time with your friends, the marketing companies could be highlighting that you were drinking Coca-Cola. Um, and because they own the rights, there is no legal constraint to do so. So the, the people who own your memories, who you are outsourcing that, they could help you reinterpret it in the way they like. Mm -hmm. So do you, have you considered that? And what are your thoughts about this kind of experience placement? Yes, well, I think that's, um, so obviously there's a massive set of businesses, the whole kind of quantified self movement. They're interested in startups which are associated with these types of technologies. In our case, we're trying to take a very personal perspective on this. So as, as I said, that was quite clear about that your, quotes, memories, the information that you log sits on a phone, and those are things that you own. However, obviously, that's not a business model. So I think the sorts of things that you're talking about, I think, are highly likely to happen. but. You know, as we've seen repeatedly with multiple examples, people make these kind of trade-offs. So Facebook might be a reasonable analogy. You might say, you know, people have great social lives where they may have casual interactions with their friends. You know, why should a company own those or brand those in some way? Well, apparently that's a pact that people are prepared to make with Facebook, right? So it could be the case that people want to do this uh, for themselves. Um, you know, that could be a business model. I mean, I, I'm not evaluating it necessarily. Yeah. Ron Becker, University of Toronto. Beautiful work. Um, two questions that are sort of related. One, and I'm particularly interested in this newest work having to do with Echo. Have you thought about this or worked with it in the context of people um, who have or who are developing Alzheimer's or other kinds of dementia where memories and in some sense reflecting on memories is so critical to one's identity and one's quality of life. And then secondly, have you thought about this in the context of collaborative memory where you don't necessarily have your own memory, your memory is in part the sum of the recollections of say you and close family members where in fact not everyone necessarily agrees. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. So, so in terms of the first one, so it's, you know, it's well attested. And one of the initial interests in SenseCam was, you know, the instructions that Alzheimer's patients get are that they're supposed to journal, 
right? And everybody knows journaling is work. And so the, you know, the interesting thing about those sense camp studies was it kind of took over some of the burden for people. I think what we've seen in our studies is that you can kind of reduce the journaling burden for some people at least, right? And I would say with our studies, we can't, we get about, uh, I guess about 16% of people maintain across multiple studies. So journaling, even if you've got the thing to journal in your hand, you know, it's on your phone, it's not embarrassing because people think you might be texting, so you can log events more easily, we still get big dropouts. So I think uh, it's a possible solution for Alzheimer's, but you know, we know that trying to get people to adhere to uh, protocols is extremely difficult. So I think promise, yes, but you know, I think there's, you know, it's not necessarily something that will definitely succeed. It, the, the second comment is kind of interesting because we actually developed ECHO, the original conception of ECHO was to be exactly what you said, right? But we couldn't get familial buy-in, right? So what we saw, so we originally designed it as some kind of like, uh, you know, I guess, uh, Facebooky type version of memories, right? And, and so we tried to uh, deploy it with uh, some early adopters and basically what we found was that, you know, in those settings, generally one person would do it and the rest of the people would be kind of dragged along. So um, I, think, I think the question, you know, you know, so if we're getting into therapeutic situations, so maybe that couple, uh, you know, the woman who was talking there, if you had real incentives to deal with the situation, maybe the two of you might commit to using it but it's, kind of, it's not, this is, I, I should say, this is not a solution for everybody because we do, you know, still get these kind of big dropout rates. But it, certainly it shows promise. And I think compared with a lot of existing uh, therapeutic techniques, um, there's a chance that it might be more um, acceptable to people because, you know, compared with, say, CBT, this kind of stuff you can do privately just to yourself. Thank you. Uh, Lil Bloom, University of Toronto. Um, I believe reflectivity tends to be, uh, some people are more reflective, some people are less reflective. Mm -hmm. And my question is, in the ECHO study, going in, were people tested for their capacity, or self-perceived, I suppose, to be reflective? Um, knows the answer, but that's, that's a very interesting question. We have done, um, we have profiled people in terms of um, kind of uh, classic attitudes to the past. In recent studies, particularly when we're looking at positive and negative, uh, we've tried to see whether people are classic ruminators. Mm -hmm. So those are people who basically process and reprocess negative events without making a great deal of progress on them. That we have done. Um, do you know a, uh, a, 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 an instrument that does reflectivity? I don't. I don't yet, but I have observed that people uh, very often tend to not be sufficiently reflective, and I see your tool as certainly one that can build a process of reflection, and is something I would love to discuss. Further. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess Pennebaker's results are kind of interesting here. I mean, we've had success, some success in the sleep context in providing uh, structured ways to remember, but Pennebaker's basic contention is if you overstructure you get kind of worse results, right? So you allow people freely to think their thoughts, provided they're actively trying to reprocess, but you don't provide them with a protocol. <coughs> Joe Marshall, um, University of Nottingham. Um, so I had a kid a <laughs> couple of years back, and um, you get to hear an awful lot of memories about your childhood uh -huh. from your parents. And if you've got divorced grandparents, you get to hear a lot of memories which are just completely contradictory, you know. And <laughs> as the child gets older, the, you've got the two grandparents' memories and your memories, and they're all contradictory. Yes. Um, can this kind of thing support, you know, construction of basically, you know, memories that are clearly, you know, some of us are lying about this stuff. <laughs> you know, it's not real, it's not things that really happened, some of this. You know, I didn't really speak French at the age of one, as my father would possibly say. Shame on you, shame you on know. you. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's kind of like Ron's, so, so I guess that's a potential application. I w you see, as I said, we've had problems in getting, you know, you know, I'll be honest, this is not a technology for everybody. So again, if you, once you start getting into this, this kind of, um, uh, group use of it, 
then your, your chance of getting everybody to buy in, I think, are rather smaller. And in particular, if you're in a situation where there are conflicts, then you know, I can, I, again, see, see people not necessarily buying in. So in a case of where you have a couple or some people who, you know, they, they admit that they've got some kind of problem, then I could see that. But I'm, I'm not sure about the kind of casual use, let's all kind of build a family memory would flop. I guess, yeah, I just wonder, do you think you could build technology to support that kind of use? Well, I, I think something not too dissimilar from this could do it, but I don't know about how you do the kind of like, um, you know, I, I guess word track changes reconciliation part of it, which is like there's a bunch of blue and red all over the over our lives, and what we have to do is agree on how we're going to, you know, tidy up that life document. Hi, Pam Briggs, Northumbria University. Um, I, I really loved uh, this talk and the work that you've done, but I was struck that having presented work on the um, recorders versus the reflectors, that a lot of your continuation work seems to be around reflection when a lot of, you know, the act of recording seems to have produced, you know, more benefits. Um, so the, a couple of things struck me. One is that there might be um, some work in the new self-compassion literature that's relevant there, so that going back and being critical of yourself <laughs> and your actions at certain time might not be the, the optimum strategy. Mm -hmm. and, and that then leads me to think uh, with your new work where you're maybe presenting positive or negative instances or re, you know, representing those, whether there's a sense that that could be joined to your previous work where maybe some things should fade away and you strategically yeah, yeah. allow that yeah, to yeah. fade. So, so, so I, think, I think what we're saying, and don't quote me on this, is, is the, the negative stuff is kind of interesting because um, we think Pennebaker's right that if something's kind of intensely negative, then it's a problem that has to be solved, but people say, simply get depressed by kind of minor annoyances to them being represented to them, right? So got a parking ticket, right? And the system represents that to you multiple times, right? <laughs> That's not something you can kind of build a life around, right? <laughs> and and, and so, so, so what we're saying is, is, you know, because we did not constrain, you know, obviously you can't say to people, we'd like you to participate in our study, and by the way, please try and have a bunch of traumas. <laughs> right? You, you know, so they're, they're doing negative stuff, but a lot of it is kind of trivially negative. And I think that is kind of, interestingly, that's a little bit depressing. So I think that's, you know, part of maybe, so we, I, I do believe that with the deep reflectors who've got problems, then they are seeing benefits from that. But, you know, in the general procedure, I think there's this kind of um, interference effect from the small negative events, which is kind of pulling uh, some of that down when people re-see them. But that's a great point. Thank you. Hi, uh, Aran Toch, Tel Aviv University. So first, thank you for this inspiring body of work and talk. Uh, I'm kind of following up on the question on, on the social context of reflection and looking back. And uh, as, as lots of us have Facebook now and we have some of these elements working, but we're working in a social environment where privacy uh, social relations, things are much more complicated. How, how much of this is relevant for, for example, a social context? If we take reflection, what would you change to make it possible in, in a social network? Social so so, so I, I think, I, I think uh, we can speculate, but it's a slightly different situation, isn't it? Facebook, because you're actually projecting a public face in Facebook. Um, and, you know, clearly it, it has some of the same characteristics we're seeing here that, you know, Facebook users generally tend to be extremely positive about, which may be good because I believe there's a bunch of studies which show that, um, yeah. you know, if you see positive things on Facebook, that's good. So I think you could, you could draw some lessons from this, but I think the situation is subtly different. I mean, I don't know whether, I can't remember this. Um, so there's this kind of your life in Facebook. I can't remember what it's called. Can somebody remind you the thing that, shows you the most, the most fed back, upvoted things in your life. Last year in Facebook, something like yeah, that. Yeah, the motivating music, right? So that's an attempt to kind of build out kind of peak experiences as viewed by the Facebook friend community, you know, and present you with those. So I think some of these techniques are possible in the Facebook domain, but, you know, I'm not sure how much I'd like to generalize what we're seeing into that domain. And, and we're trying to remain outside that. 
uh, for the moment at least. Right. Thank you. One more question. <laughs> okay, okay. Ju no, just one. Jo one. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Well, uh, it's Con Conrad Thornburg, KTH. Uh, <laughs> Jolly good. Uh, short question and a comment. Uh, the short question is like, oh, I have a computer science background, but the way I recall co uh, classes uh, was that when you had a very bad uh, memory of something, you remember quite well the positive things around that. Did I completely got that wrong or not? You can show a bonnet. And the comment would then be more like, when we start to build these kind of things that research things that really has an impact on people's life and they start to use them and so forth, what are the ethical implications? Like, how sh long should we kind of maintain software like this and system like this? And yeah, so well, I, I, I think, I think this, this is really tricky because um, I did mention the two. So the second point I, I think is very problematic. We try and actively screen people. Um, you know, so we have a bunch of screener questions and we don't, because this is like drugs, you know, one analogy would be that it's the equivalent to giving people kind of untested drugs, right? And I should say, you know, for these prototypes, you know, we don't know what they're going to do to people. So we try and screen out people who have any kind of history of mental health problems. And the two people that you saw here, they actually got through those screeners. But we're basically trying not to get into that world because I think there are very strong ethical implications. But it's possible once we better understand these things that we could move. But I think we need to go extremely carefully because we all know how flaky our own research software is and we don't want to be foisting that upon people. But I think that's a really important point. OK, okay one more question. OK, I'll make it Who quick. are you? Uh, I'm your co-chair from CSCW 2000. <laughs> I really wish you would burn those pictures. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wendy Kellogg from IBM Research. So um, I have, over the course, thank you, first of all, for a really interesting talk and nice body of work. Uh, I've become obsessed with your application over the course of the talk. And I think Echo's got to go. You've got to call it InstaMe, uh -huh. conversations uh, one on one or one with one or something like that. Thanks but, for um, the branding. While we're on the topic of you know ethics and so forth, I'd. I, I won't go into details here, but I would like to outsource my memories, particularly for the last year. So I'm wondering uh, what your speculation would be on a version of Echo that uh, is kind of a cross between what you've got and JibJab, which allows people to stick uh, heads of their friends and family members on animated cartoons, you know, music videos, basically, like to let's get physical or whatever it is. And um, you know, I'm wondering actually if you saw yourself, or if you just watched a story of somebody else doing a happy thing, whether that would start to have the same kind of impact as working with your own authentic memories, because I think that would be interesting to know. It's, you know, just generic, another person, not a person like you, but just Well, I, I, would, I was suggesting contrasting two things with what you have. You know, mm -hmm. this is like these effects are interesting on autobiographical, my real memories, mm -hmm. right? But what if you provided snapshots that uh, could be essentially photoshopped with me? These are memories that I are see. So faked, it's a bit like you know, I, not, nothing yeah. I ever experienced. Or if I watch somebody else I don't know, like watching a movie. Having yeah, or reading a book. So it's the same. Yeah, so basically, does that have the impact on on your state of mind, your happiness, whatever? Could it? Um, well, I don't think it would. Uh, I mean, so obviously, those technologies bring you immersion if they're well designed. But I think a lot of the benefits that we saw here was it was people actually trying to deal with things about themselves. But I'm not ruling it out altogether. I mean, I think it could be interesting, but it'd be kind of so I'm uh, saying take it to a, schem a schema level of breakups with boyfriends, spouses, you know, so, bereavement. So it's all, there's, all, there's a pattern there. And yeah, so, so I guess people, some people using online communities, they use, they use them in the same way that what they're very interested in now is in narratives from other people in those self-help communities who've gone through things that are similar to them. Right? And so that could be something that's analogous to the, the situation you're describing. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you very, very much. <laughs> we wait for the
the next lifetime. <laughs>